Let's go straight now to the Republican Congressman Trey Gowdy. He's a chairman of the House Oversight Committee, and he also sits on the crucial intelligence committee we're talking about right now, as well as the Judiciary Committee. Uh, Congressman Gowdy, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I, I want to give you a chance right away to respond to uh, this memo uh, sent by the Assistant uh, Attorney General here to uh, Devin Nunes, uh, the chairman of your House Intelligence Committee. He says it would be reckless to release that memo uh, w without showing it to the Department of Justice for them to review it. What do you say? Well, Aaron, thank you for having me on. And let me say this at the outset. I have tremendous respect for the Department of Justice uh, and the FBI. I worked uh, in and with them for 18 of my uh, professional years. So there's no member of Congress that holds that department in higher esteem than I do. I, I have concerns about what was done in the spring and the fall of 2016. Um, and, and I'm not uh, a critic of the department. I'm not someone who alleges the department is corrupt. Uh, I'm a fan of the department, and I have concerns about what they did in 2016. So I would say this to my friend Stephen Boyd, um, let, let's lower the rhetoric. Uh, I don't care if you see the memo, but, but let's be clear about this, Aaron. The memo was derived, distilled from information that the department gave us. So it's not like there's new information. Everything in the memo they already have. What they don't okay. know specifically is what are their complaints, and I'm fine to share them with them, but you can't possibly say a memo is reckless if you haven't read it. So, so, so let me ask you a crucial question here. Have you seen the underlying intelligence, classified intelligence, that this memo, right, because this is a summary written by the Republican chairman, have you seen the actual intelligence that it is based on? And is it 100 yep. percent consistent with the memo as you have seen it? Um, the, the answer to your first question, Aaron, is yes. I may be the only member who's read it all. Um, I went to the Department of Justice on Jerry a couple Nadler, of different Democrat, occasions. Jerry Nadler, Democrat, told me yesterday that he had as well. All right, that'd be two. Well, Jerry's not on Intel. Jerry's on Judiciary. More power to him. I, I think everybody ought to go down there and read it. It's really hard to have a conversation about what's in documents when you hadn't read those documents. Yeah. Glad Jerry did it. I, I've read it all. Um, I have concerns um, about uh, the process, about representations that may be made in court pleadings. I have concerns about the duty of government. Uh, to provide complete, full, accurate information. You know, FBI agents and prosecutors are not advocates at this stage. We are, we, we are representatives to the court. So there is an obligation to present accurate, full, complete information. Um, okay. and, and that's true in every criminal case or every counterintelligence case. They just don't get the scrutiny that this one does. Okay, they're saying, though, and then, again, I just want to make the point, Stephen Boyd, the assistant attorney general who signed a... Uh, this letter that, that I'm looking at right now, it says in it, among other things, not only do they think it would be reckless to release uh, Chairman Nunes' memo, but they have seen no evidence of any wrongdoing to the FISA process. And, and the reason that this is so crucial, again, let's make the point, Stephen Boyd is Donald Trump's nominee. He is saying to you all that he has not seen any evidence of what is being alleged. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would say this again. I, I, I like Stephen. I, I work well with him. Um, it, it's really difficult to say a memo is reckless when you haven't read it. Um, to the extent he says that they've seen no evidence of any impropriety or untowardness or inappropriate conduct during the process, we just respectfully disagree. Um, and, and, and that happens from time to time. Lawyers can look at the same fact pattern and draw two different conclusions. I'm sure Adam Schiff is going gonna, is gonna to do a minority memo where, where he doesn't see any problems. So, but the, what that advocates for, though, Aaron, is the release of non-classified material, re release it in, in, in an appropriate form, and let the public decide. That's what that, that's okay, what that but, advocates but, but how for. is that consistent with your saying, how can anyone truly talk about this and the implications of it if they haven't seen the underlying information? From what I understand, nobody's advocating to release the underlying information for what is a partisan memo that's coming out of it because it's so classified. Are yeah, you saying the underlying information I, I, that you read, the top secret information, should also be released so everyone can read the source data no. and then decide if they think the summary is fair or not? 
No, no, I, 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 I don't. Uh, the president can declassify it. I, I, my counsel to him is don't do it. Do yeah. nothing to jeopardize sources and methods. Do nothing to jeopardize the women and men in the intelligence community. But you and I are having a conversation about it right now without divulging classified information. People do it all day, every day. It can be done. You have to do it adroitly and you have to do it carefully, but you can have a conversation. I mean, we'll do it right now. Do you think information should be vetted before before it is included in a court proceeding. That would be a question I have for you. If uh, a hypothetical source is being paid by a political opponent, do you think that should be shared with a court or with a judge? See, you and I just did it. And, and, and I think the answer is yes, that should be shared with the court. And if it's not shared with the court, then you got to tell me why it wasn't important enough to do so. Chairman, I want to ask you about a couple of other things tonight. Uh, one is the other news that has been breaking over the past few hours. Uh, regarding the text messages exchanged between uh, Mr. Strzok and Ms. Page. Thousands of FBI-issued phones, we are finding out today, were affected by this technical glitch. All right, it resulted in five months of mis missing text data. And we are now told, a law enforcement official is telling CNN, about one in 10 FBI phones were affected. So it's not just these two. It's about, it's thousands, it's one in 10 phones uh, that were affected that has this exact same data outage. Do you accept that this was a technical glitch, or do you think there's some sort of conspiracy theory here? I'm not a conspiracist, um, and I have no reason to impeach or undercut uh, what the department is representing and what the FBI has represented. Um, it, it, it puts those of us who are fans and supporters of the department and the Bureau in an awkward position. There's a five-month gap that's really important, mm -hmm. but, but I have no reason to not believe them. I hope Michael Horowitz or someone else will, will verify it, but I, I'm not a conspiracist. I, I, I'm every bit as concerned about the text we do have as the five months worth that we don't. And, and the ones that we do have evidence a level of bias that I have never seen before from any law enforcement officer, and it is troubling. And, and I am eminently more interested in discussing the texts that do exist than theorizing about what's in the ones that don't. All right, so let's, let's talk about what we have. First of all, I just want to point out for the record, of course, that the special counsel, Bob Mueller, last summer when he found out about the text messages, which did indicate bias by uh, the, the senior agent struck, he removed him from the team, okay? He removed him uh, immediately upon finding that out. Uh, but let's just share one of them that I know that you have talked about as well as your, uh, your, your, your uh, Republican senatorial co colleague, Senator Johnson. Uh, this one is from May 19th uh, of last summer, so it's right after the five-month glitch. And in it, uh, struck text page referring to the Russia investigation ostensibly. You and I both know the odds are nothing. If I thought it was likely, I'd be there, no question. I hesitate in part because of my gut sense and concern there's no big there there. Okay, the assumption being made here is that they're talking about his willingness to join the Russia investigation. But my question to you is, Congressman, doesn't this show you that whatever his personal political beliefs were, which he's, he's saying here, if I thought it was likely, I'd be there, no question. But he didn't have a bias against uh, Trump on Russia. He's saying... There's no big there there. I don't think there's anything there. You know what, Aaron? Uh, respectfully, it tells me the exact opposite because just above that text is a conversation about impeachment. And every single FBI agent I know would look at what Bob Mueller is doing right now and saying, you are performing a national service from a counterintelligence standpoint mm -hmm. and from a criminal standpoint. It's just not how many pelts you can tack up against the wall in terms of guilty pleas and convictions. Bob Mueller is also doing a counterintelligence investigation about a foreign adversary that attacked our country in 2016. And if that doesn't get an FBI agent excited enough to participate in an investigation, that's heartbreaking. So I read that text exactly differently. If it's not going to result in a conviction against the president of the United States, I'm not interested in participating. I don't know another bureau agent that would take that approach. All right, but I, I'm just making the point. He obviously didn't think there was a there there. So he didn't go into the Russia investigation, which he, he then subsequently joined before Mueller removed him. He didn't go into it thinking the president was guilty. He went into it thinking the opposite. So as much as the guy, as you're pointing out, hates the president... He didn't see any there, though. He wasn't, he wasn't going in thinking he was going to find anything. Well, the only thing I would say in response to that, Aaron, is the morning after the election, they're discussing impeachment. So if they're really open-minded, objective, fact-centric FBI agents, what are they doing discussing impeachment 
when the ink isn't dry on, on, on the ballot confirmation yet. This is the morning after, and they're talking about impeachment. So, look, I, I have a lot of respect for you. You're going to have a really hard time convincing me that Peter Strzok should have been on this investigation. Okay, so let me, let me ask you, and by the way, again, I'm just, I'm just pointing because I, I, I need to for the record, that Bob Mueller did remove him when he found out about these texts. So Peter Strzok was removed I, I, from this last Bob summer. Uh, just, just, just to make sure everyone You've knows, it wasn't like he stayed on this Mueller. investigation for, for some period of time That's after right. this was discovered. Okay, in the You've text messages... You've never heard me criticize Bob Mueller. Right, and uh, you have said um, that, that you've seen the ones, the text which exist, uh, the ones that we know about, personally. Um, one that was sent the day after the election... Uh, which you're referring to impeachment, but one of the ones you've talked about, you quoted it as saying, quote, perhaps this is the first meeting of the secret society. You didn't give any context, okay? What, what was the context? Did they, did they elaborate? What, what are we talking about, secret society? Oh, uh, it's right after they're lamenting the fact that Trump, wo Trump won North Carolina and that he won uh, <laughs> Florida, and uh, they're really disappointed in the way the election turned out. And then about an inch down from that is a conversation about perhaps this is, should be the first meeting of the secret society. And then about two texts down, they say, let's talk about it with Andy. I don't know if that's Andy McCabe, and I'm not going to allege that it is. But it's eerily similar By to what they it right said now, about the insurance kind of, policy. You kind of are. You're throwing it out into no, no, no. the ether. I mean. Well, 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 Andy McCabe is mentioned throughout their text. I don't know if there's another Andy. So, so mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if there is or not. So I, I'm not going to malign Andy McCabe. Uh, I actually asked him directly about the insurance policy text, and he denied it. I take him at his word. But take mm -hmm. him out of it. Here, here are two bureau agents talking <clears> about a secret society. I don't have any, I don't have a clue what they're talking about. I don't know whether one existed, but you know what, Aaron, it's not my responsibility to prove that. They're the ones who use the phrase. They're the ones that should explain it. I can't tell you what they meant. I can just tell you what they said. And they talking about a secret society right after they were talking about how depressed they were that Donald Trump won.